some people think that book cover design is more of an artsy type of feeling and that there's a lot of room for variation. Um, actually, book cover design should be pretty simple. And if your book isn't selling and the cover is the reason, then you need a new cover. And there are ways to find out whether the cover is doing its job um, of selling the books. And if not, you need to get a new one. So it's something I'll show you how to test and find out whether or not your cover is working. And then I'll give you some of the basics. Even if you're going to work with a designer or hire a professional, you still need to know what makes a good book cover design because some designers are very good designers, but they don't really know what kind of covers sell books for different genres. Um, but if you educate yourself a little bit about how a book cover goes together and what kind of book cover makes an impact on the type of readers you want to attract, uh, that'll make you that'll help you to make a more informed book cover design decision. Also, I'd like to highlight this part. I used to always say the job of a book cover is to sell the book. That's not what I say anymore because you can't sell the book in the book cover. The book cover's job is just to get them to pick up the book, just to hook their attention enough so that they click on the cover or pick up the book, turn it over, and start reading the description. The description is where you sell them the book. That's where you tell them what the book is about. The cover, you don't have the time or the space to tell them what the book is about. All you have to do is attract their attention enough to want them so that they want to know what the book is about. I'm going to dive straight into the, the seven qualities. Um, we'll actually cover a lot more than these in this presentation. But these are some of the basics. Color contrast, you can get a color wheel and just see what color opposites uh, match. I always recommend teal and orange because teal and orange are kind of the perfect um, contrasting colors. But besides colors, you also want a lot of light and dark contrast. So blacks against whites, a lot of um, light spaces and dark spaces. Spacing and kerning, this is mostly about the text elements. You just want to make sure the text isn't all crammed together. Kerning, that word with a K, is also about the spacing between the letters. So you've got to, some fonts, even if you just type out the font regularly, some letters have more spacing than others, um, like an A and a W has too much spacing. So a professional designer will check the spacing between all the letters and make sure that they're evenly spaced. Appropriate title fonts for the genre. Um, most indie authors, they find a font they really like and they just use it for everything all over the book cover. So it's a really simple giveaway of an amateur book cover is if the author name and the book title has the same font and maybe the subtitle has the same font too. You want one good fancy font for the title that's appropriate for the genre um, and kind of suggests the, the mood or the feeling of the genre. But for the small text and the subtitle, your author name, you just want a simple serif or sans serif font. You don't want two fancy fonts. And number six is a scene, not a collage. Um, some indie authors want to put in everything that has to do with their their cover. And actually, this word scene isn't a great word either because authors are usually thinking of a scene. They're usually thinking of a scene in their novel where this happens and this guy is reaching towards this girl and they're wearing these clothes and looking at each other with these expressions and they have, you know, these um, weapons that they're holding. That kind of scene, not only is it a nightmare to find the stock photography and to Photoshop it together, but even if you do a really good job, it's not really going to work as well as something much simpler. So when I say a scene, um, and I'll show you examples later, you basically want one background and maybe one character. There are examples of multiple characters and complex scenes. Um, if you have a bigger budget, if you're working with a really talented designer or artist, you might be able to make that happen. It can be powerful. I think you can do just as well having a much simpler cover. And finally, a humanizing element. It doesn't have to be a person. I know a lot of authors are against people on covers, um, especially if you're using a lot of stock photography, and you're going to see the same stock photography models show up on a lot of different covers. It's actually not as big of a problem as you think. But um, there's no real decision about whether whether a cover with a person or a face on it is better than one without it. Readers argue about what they like better. Um, so it's not really a big deal, but you do want a humanizing element, which just means if you don't have a person, at least you have some object or some belonging or some possession, just something that kind of 
there's somebody in the scene, even if they're not physically present, they're referred to um, somehow. Here's a couple things to show you. You'll notice right away the contrast between teal and um, orange. And that's not only, these are young adult dystopian covers, but once you know to look for it, you'll see it in movie posters, you'll see it in all sorts of design, because it really is just powerful contrasting colors. And you'll also see a lot of dark and light contrast. Um, I'm not a big fan of heavy drop shadow behind the text, like this Allegiant cover. It works here, especially because this is more like a urban dystopia, so it's okay to have really sharp fonts. Um, and you'll notice like up here, you can see the drop shadow around the small text, but you can't really, this is how I prefer the most text to be, just really good, clear, simple text on a background where you don't need a drop shadow because there's already enough natural contrast. So this one too, they had to put in some drop shadow behind the text. Um, I try not to do that if I can, maybe it's just a preference, but what a lot of indie authors will do is they'll put a heavy drop shadow behind the text to make it stand out. And that often looks messy. So if you can avoid it, it's better. I like to contrast these two covers because they're pretty similar, actually. Um, they're using similar fonts. This one and this one's probably Trajan or Trajan Pro. Um, the reason that I like this cover more, uh, there's many reasons, but the yellow and the blue are really good contrasts. They have contrasting fonts. So they have a, a sans serif font and a serif font that contrast really nicely. They also have all the upper caps and the lower caps down here in the tagline. Um, and this is just a simple scene with a humanizing element. There's a person in the scene. This one is really similar, but I don't think it's as powerful because I don't think the green and the yellow and the orange, they're not contrasting colors enough, even though they have a, a really strong light and dark contrast. But also this font up here, the kerning isn't so great, like the R and the O and the R and the M. Um, that's a problem with that font, which is why I don't really like Trajan Pro very much. But also they put the pretty heavy drop shadow up here to set it off from the sky, and I wouldn't have done that. So I've kind of touched on this already, but what a lot of indie authors do wrong is that they think of a scene or specific scenes from the book. Um, and they may also think of something really symbolic or something that means something to the characters or something that's really important to the, the story. Um, the problem with most, most of those ideas is that they're referring to things that happen inside of the book and they're not going to matter to the readers who haven't read the book yet. So if it's too in-depth, if it's anything that like if the author can explain the meaning of the cover, that's probably a mistake because if the cover doesn't explain itself, if it's not immediate, then it's not really going to do its job. Um, some readers will say that they really like a cover that has a lot of meaning, but they'll only know that after they've bought the book and read the book. If you're not making the sale, that's going to be a big problem. Um, another thing that indie authors do is they, there have been some articles about like uh, cliched book covers or book covers that recycle stock photography. So some indie authors just decide they're going to do something totally different. And sometimes I'll work with clients who say stuff like, um, well, I don't care what's normal. I don't care what most people do in the publishing industry. I want my book to be fresh and unique and different and stand out. Um, but if it doesn't, if it doesn't tell readers immediately that it's the type of book that they like to read, if it doesn't let them know um, what genre it is, what it's about, um, if it doesn't catch their attention, it doesn't really matter how unique or fresh it is. The only difference is in literary fiction, literary fiction books often have fresh or unique covers, but only if they're mainstream published literary fiction because they can get away with it. If you're self-publishing, even if you're self-publishing literary fiction, I'd probably go with a more generic genre cover because you've got to get people to take a chance on reading it um, and they won't necessarily be drawn by something clever or fresh or unique. Uh, the other time it can work is in nonfiction. Sometimes nonfiction books need a fresh, unique, clever idea, but even so, it's probably something simple and immediate and powerful so that you look at it and it kind of shocks your brain. Um, often I'll do like a, a juxt juxtaposition. I'll take two things that don't really belong together and I'll put them together in an interesting way that represents the theme of the book, but you're not really trying to explain everything. 
And that's the same thing with this. Your, your cover isn't to tell readers what the book is about. It's just to get them to pick up the book. So even little stuff, I'll talk more about this later, but little stuff like um, small text or the taglines or the reviews, a lot of authors will say, I want to put all that stuff on the cover. Even stuff like book awards, um, often they'll want to put a book award seal on the cover. And I, really, I usually don't recommend that because a book award seal can ruin the design of a cover. And book awards are rational purchasing decisions. Um, it's information. It's not, it's not the immediate emotional impact that you want your cover to have. It's one of the selling points of your book. So you want to get their attention first and get them to read the description. And that's where you can say it's won all these awards. It has all these great reviews. Um, but you don't want to try to do too much with the cover. So I'm going to start going into some case studies. I really like talking about Hugh Howey's book covers um, because he's been tremendously successful. And it's also an example of you can start off with a cover that isn't that great and still be very successful. So the cover isn't like the, the gateway. It's possible to publish something with a homemade or a cheap cover. Um, well, it may have been, it's probably less possible now than it was five or six years ago because there's so much competition, but it's still possible. It still happens. Um, however, it's fun to see what Hugh Howey's covers have become because when he first started publishing, he was doing them himself or hiring cheap. And now he can do whatever he wants. So he can hire the best designers and get really professional design made. Um, so here's a before and here's an after. And this one, this is Wool, which is Hugh Howey's pretty big, famous book. I love that, um, like I was saying, this is, a, this is how an author would make a scene. So they're thinking of a specific scene in the book. They're thinking of using the steel wool to clean the windows and see the blue sky and the green grass um, outside of the windows. These are all the people living down in the bunker. So it's an idea, it's a concept. It doesn't really work that well for cover design. This is a fan art. Someone else basically took the same idea and did it well. So it's it's the same idea. It's got this steel wool and the fire and it's got contrast. It's, it's well designed, but it's still conceptual. It still doesn't make any sense to people who haven't read the book yet. Um, and it's too busy. So here's the, now that it, the book's been picked up and republished by a traditional publisher, they went with something really simple that just shows the genre, basically. It gives the tension and the feeling, the, the red colors, kind of the scary. Um, it has the, the rough texture to show that it's kind of a futuristic dystopia. Um, and they put this big seal up here that compares it to the Hunger Games. And these are just simple fonts. There's no fancy fonts. It's just a simple sans serif and serif font. But it's a really strong cover. And you could also say that, I mean, the bigger you get, the less work your book cover has to do. But it's still better to go with something simple than to go with something too complex. So here's the same thing. When he first started out, some of the mistakes, he used the same font um, in every part of the book. And it's not a really great font. And it's not a really great background image. This is a fan art that's a remake, which is really well designed. Um, but again, it's trying to do too much. And so even like in the reflection of the water, there's the characters' faces down here, which you wouldn't even see unless you were really looking hard. And it's the kind of thing that most people just won't see. So it's not going to, it might be fun to realize later, but it's not impacting the sales. And then this is the new cover after it got picked up, um, which is my favorite Hugh Howey cover and just a really awesome cover. So it's, um, it's very similar to the first one in the colors. It's just much more professionally designed. It has a lot of fancy, it's still a simple serif font, but it's had a lot of um, fancy Photoshop shopping done. So I'm going to go into some stuff that Mark Coker said because Mark uh, runs Smashwords. So he has a lot of data because he gets to look at tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of books um, and see what's selling and also see the impact if an author, for example, changes her cover and all of a sudden sales go through the roof. He has all that data. So he really gets to, um, he's learned a lot about book cover design. So here's a few things that he says that I appreciate. Uh, this is the book 
you're looking for to experience the feeling of something. So you want your book cover to make a promise to the readers, and that's probably going to be a promise of the emotion your book will will give them. So if it's a romance, they're going to feel happy. Um, if it's chiclet, they might you know it might be uplifting or funny. If it's a thriller, it's going to be um, thrilling. I don't know. Um, you can actually look up colors because if you look at like a, the emotion color scale a really easy thing to do is just think thrillers should be red um a, a romantic comedy would be light blue or pink so you can think just like how do certain colors make you feel and that's the color you want to use uh, for certain genres but then mark's also talking about he has one book out that he's had for a while um, and the cover doesn't, it's not really working. So he's saying, is this book erotic or pornography? No, but the reader doesn't know because the image isn't resonating with the right promise. We're probably chasing away readers who would otherwise be down, drawn to the story. So I was curious, so I looked it up. Um, this is BoobTube, and it's a well-designed cover, and I get what they were trying to do, but the problem with the cover is that it's not, it, it doesn't say enough about what the story uh, or what genre it's in, but it also probably does scare away people who don't know like is you know what's what is it about i'm not looking for a romance or something sexy so you know is it funny is it a comedy or what um all he has is a novel but this really could be any type of book so i made a quick um makeover <clears throat> and mine is nothing fancy it's really simple i use simple fonts um one picture the picture doesn't really say enough about the genre but i took this um it's one of the quotes from Amazon, and all I did was edit the quote down to hit a couple um, powerful selling points. So it says, ridiculous obsessions of the soap stars, too close to the truth to be laughable. So that tells you that it's sort of funny. Um, it's about soap opera stars and TV, but it's also pretty realistic and gritty because it's close to the truth. So something like that, I think, would sell better. And if you wanted to, if you wanted to be a little sexier or a little cooler, you could just add in a little bit of a picture behind here and make this black. Um, this is more probably light and funny. This is a little more dramatic and serious, but I think both would be pretty good options. Here at the London Book Fair, <clears throat> I saw this presentation by Damien Horner about the seven foolproof design tips, and I just wanted to go over it quickly because a lot of it reinforces some of the things I've been saying, and it's really a good idea to reinforce um, some of these issues. But also this last one, number seven, be clear before you're clever. That's kind of my go-to catchphrase now for cover design. So these are some of the things that Damien mentioned, um, and I am rephrasing them in my own understanding, so they may not be exactly what he intended. The first is just membership, which means it should actually fit in with the other books in your genre. A lot of indie authors think their books should stand out and be different, but actually it really should fit in. So when you put your book on a shelf with 20 of the best-selling books in your genre, um, does, it, does it fit in? Does it look like one of those books? Does it belong in that category? If you find, I mean, if you look at the top 20 best-selling books in your genre on Amazon or in a bookstore, you'll see similar similarities in the colors and in the fonts. Um, so those are the things that you want to look out for. Number two is lust factor. That's just, you need to make a really beautiful cover, a really professional um, cover that people just want to, like if people run their fingers over the cover, that's a good sign. That means you've done it well. Um, often that can be done with a lot of contrast, with really nice topography. With traditional publishing, they often put in um, special stuff like, spot varnish or um, embossed covers. Those aren't really things that you can do on your own, although you can order small batches from Clay's printing. Clay's will help you to do some of that stuff. Number three is the blink test, which just means close your eyes, open them, close them, just blink really quickly. Does the cover have that immediate impact? Does it make you feel what it's supposed to? Um, can you tell what genre it's in? Does it look professional? You don't want, like if you ask for feedback on your cover, you don't want people to stare at it for a long time and really look at it because that's not how they're actually going to be shopping. 
when they're on Amazon, they'll just be scrolling through and they might see your cover for a second. And if it either, they're either going to click on it or pick it up and read because it, it had its effect. It's did it, it's did its job by getting your attention um, or it's gone. And they're, they're not going to stay, stay there and stare at it and look at it uh, unless you ask them to. Your friends or your family or people on Facebook, they'll examine your cover. But that's also why their feedback isn't really um, that valuable because they're not responding to the book cover the same way that they would respond to regular books in the bookstore. With subtitles and taglines, there's an interesting thing with your covers in that you don't have to repeat elements. So for example, if you have a vampire story, you don't have to have vampire in the title and in the subtitle and in the picture. You don't have to have three vampires. You just need one of those. So if you have a picture of a vampire, you probably don't have to call it um, a vampire romance to let readers know because they can tell by the picture. In the same way, if your book is called a vampire romance, I wouldn't put a vampire on the cover because that's already obvious from the title. So I would use the cover to do other things um, because you've, you've got to be kind of conservative with your space and make choices. Consider your distribution platform just means where is your book going to be? So if you're mostly on Kindle, you want to design for Kindle. And what most authors talk about is designing for your thumbnail so that your thumbnail is readable um, when it's viewed on Amazon. I disagree with that because people don't read thumbnails. People click on thumbnails to read the cover or more often than not, they see the thumbnail and they see the text right next to the thumbnail, which is almost always there on most devices. Um, so having people read the thumbnail isn't a consideration you need to be worried about, but you can still tell as a thumbnail whether the cover is well designed, um, what genre it's in, whether it has really contrasting lights and darks and colors. So it's, imp I mean, it's still very important to have a, a thumbnail that looks good, but you don't want to, for example, you make the text really big in the thumbnail, and then when you click on it, it just looks too big and kind of amateurish because you were focusing on the thumbnail more than the actual book cover. You always want the actual book cover to be the important thing. It should also look really good as a thumbnail, but that's only because you've designed a really good cover. Hierarchy just means you have to make decisions about what's most important. Um, this usually is a problem when you have a title and you have a tagline and you have a series header. Um, so for example, my new book is Prescient. The tagline is probably a young adult dystopian time travel romance. And I might have a, a series um, title at the top, which would be like book one in the fortune telling series or something like that. So you have all this information. Some authors will just make it all the same size and they'll just have big text and everything will be the same size and readers won't know what to look at first or what's most important. Almost always you want your title to be big and everything else to be really small. Um, almost always. Um, but you have to make decisions usually like what's, what are they going to see first? What are they going to see next? Maybe the picture is the most important thing and you want the title to kind of get out of the way of the picture. Um, but it's something you need to consider because that's something that some people screw up. And seven I mentioned is just be clear before you're clever. It just means before you try to be different or, or smart or innovative or creative even, um, you have to be clear. Your cover has to communicate the mood and the genre and it has to attract readers of that genre really quickly. So these are just some case studies um, that I'll go through quickly that I've made for clients. And you'll notice in the before and after, I don't really like to show, um, I've done this in other presentations where I just take random ugly book covers from the internet, but that's not very nice for whoever's authors I'm talking about. Um, so these are authors that I've worked with who started off with covers that are pretty average um, in terms of what self-publishing authors are publishing these days. And these are even books that have done pretty well. They just weren't doing as well as the authors wanted. Um, and so I've done makeovers for them. I like doing makeovers because I can basically take the same idea and just 
redo it and make it better and use nice pictures and nice fonts um, saves me a lot of time. Uh, but you'll notice common problems. Um, they use the same fonts. These fonts are too squeezed together. It's it's common for indie authors to to have a bar, like just square chunks of pictures laid out. I kind of do the same thing, but at least I blended them together. And then this one, because it's a thriller, I just used um, really simple fonts, one color scheme, which is pretty common in thrillers. Oops. I'll give you a little more time to look at that. Um, I'm not saying my covers are amazing. I just think it's nice to see the before and after. These fonts just don't stand out against the blue. A lot of authors will try to put the, the stroke, which is that black line around the text, or they'll put a really heavy drop shadow. Um, this one, they use the bevel. I'm not a fan of bevel or drop shadow um, or glow even. You want your text to stand out naturally without putting any special effects on it. So here's some more. These these ones are newer. I think um, it's kind of fun also just looking at my designs because I, I do get better as a designer. So even the covers that I'm making now are better than they were a year or two ago. This is just a kind of plain cover, no colors, no contrast. The, the, the fonts don't really show what kind of uh, book it is or what genre it is. Uh, this one's, it has some color in the purple, um, but there's no contrast, there's no dark and light contrast, and she's using the same fonts for everything. So in this one, I used a similar font that's just a little bit nicer. I used teal and orange for the contrast, and then I just contrasted a, a simple a sans serif font with this more fancy one. So I'm going to go through three foolproof design strategies for every genre. I said earlier, you don't really want a collage. Um, so these are layouts that work for just about every genre. The difficulty is if you're making these on your own, it can be hard to blend images. If you don't have any software for graphic design, I put up a online graphic design editor at DIYbookcovers.com. It's not perfect, but it's kind of like Photoshop and it's flash based, so it's online. So you can actually upload your pictures and blend them together. Um, so if you don't have Photoshop or you're looking for a way to do that, there's a lot of other really nice graphic design uh, programs we'll talk about later, but even the really good ones, you can't really blend images together or use layers, which you probably will need to do. But even if you just pick one beautiful picture, uh, like this cover is just one picture with a little bit of design up at the top to show the genre, um, simple fonts, typography. This one's one picture. I really like how they only use natural contrast here. So even like this eye kind of disappears into her leg. That's okay. It doesn't, it's still readable. You, it doesn't have to be as bold as you think it would have to be. There, a lot of designers would have a temptation to put a, a drop shadow behind this text. Um, like in this one, it stands out a little bit more probably because they have a little bit of a drop shadow behind the text. Also, these aren't just one picture. Um, this one, they probably added the sky up here. Same with this one. Often you'll get something that looks like one picture, but probably this was some clouds and a cabin and forest and water. They, the, the artist made it into one scene or one picture, um, but that's still what you want. You just want one Nice, clean picture. This boy was probably added here, <clears throat> um, but it, he gives really good contrast, color contrast. So if you can get away with just one really nice picture with simple font, that's kind of a safe bet. So all of these just have simple serif or sans serif fonts. Um, one color scheme. This one has a, actually all of these have a little bit of contrast with the, the teal and the yellow or the orange that I mentioned before. So even this one, like it's a little bit bluish here and a little bit yellowish here. So those are color contrasts. But otherwise, it's just one simple picture. They added some black up here, simple fonts, nothing fancy. This kind of thing could work for most genres, although the simpler you get, um, the more, I want to say older, the more older reader you're going for, or the more, um, there's got to be a word for it, 
I'll, I'll say it the opposite, which is just when you're designing for children or young adults, you'll design bigger. You'll have flashier design and flashier fonts and more decoration. So the younger you're designing for, the more you have to design. Um, and usually the older you're designing for, if people are reading like more serious books or thrillers or historical fiction, those are these are the types of covers that you're going to see. Um, just simpler pictures. So the other foolproof design strategy <clears throat> is to make a foreground character with a background scene. So you can do this um, in Microsoft Word. There's a really handy trick to remove the background, but it's a, it's a hack. It's not really good design. You can just pay someone on Fiverr.com. If you send them a picture of a model, they'll crop out the background and send it back to you as a PNG so that you can put it over another image. But if it's done well, there will be light, like this light comes over the, the, the figure that just makes her a little bit more of the scene. Um, and that's going to be done with, with layering. So they're putting layers of light on top of that figure to make it kind of all inclusive. But it makes for a really powerful cover. Um, it's the humanizing element that I said before. Often the characters from the back or hiding their face because some readers don't like showing the face. It can also be done with the figure being really small, especially if it's like an epic journey story. Then you'd have this really big scene in the background and show how small they are by comparison. <coughs> It can also be done by putting the, the scene in the foreground, like down below you have a city or a setting, and then you have the person up on top. And then this is one that mixed it up. Um, I just saw this today, but they did it pretty well. So there's the person and then the tunnel, and then they also added some city up here. Usually this is hard to do. Um, usually you can't put two different settings in the same picture. It's it's possible with this, like this one, it works really well, but um, often it doesn't, and it's hard to prioritize. So if you want to have, like, your book is split between London and New York City, and you really want to put both of them on the book cover, that's going to be hard to do, unless you just have, like, a straight split line or something. Down here I put, yeah, but how? Because it's hard to make this kind of cover by yourself if you're not a graphic artist. This is all mostly done with layers and blending. Um, so in Photoshop, you would open up your picture, and these are probably like a dozen different layers that are put on top of each other and then blended together. Uh, you can also do this with a program I have on DIYBookCovers.com. Uh, it's a free program, but you can upload layers and then you can use blending to show the effect. So you basically just put one layer on top of another one and then you click through the blending effects and see what looks really cool and then you'd use that. <clears throat> So the third foolproof design strategy is a close-up face. This is more common in young adult. It's just a face with some description, um, uh, sorry, some decoration or really nice typography. The interesting thing here is that like these four are young adult, but they're all really different genres. And you can kind of tell what genre they are from the font. So that's how font is used really effectively. It's just, they're very different fonts for the genre, even though actually these two, I think are the same um, author, but I might be wrong, I can't see. The other thing I was gonna mention is a lot of people, like a lot of authors will say, this font is way too small because you can't see it in a thumbnail, but you have to match the genre convention. So in the young adult genre, a lot of really famous books have very small author names. Um, part of that is because it's uh, suspense. If you're doing like a, a thriller, would have really big, bold fonts. Um, but a suspense or like a paranormal romance mystery, it can have really small author fonts, especially for the author name. It doesn't mean an author is more famous if they have a bigger author name. Um, it matters a little bit. Like I said earlier about you have to decide what's most important. So if you're if your author name is more important than the title because your fans are going to buy anything you write, then your author name would want to be really big and the title smaller. But most of us aren't that famous 
And even if you're pretty famous, you still want to match the, the genre conventions. Um, so if most of the best-selling books that you want your book to be associated with have really tiny fonts for the author name, you want to do something like that. You're good enough, and how can you tell? Because it's actually really hard to find out if you're not a designer and you're trying to evaluate your own book cover design or get feedback, it can be really difficult to, um, to figure out what's wrong with the cover or whether you need a new one. So getting feedback is hard for several reasons. Um, one, like I said, is just that if you ask for feedback, people are gonna consider the cover too intimately. Most of the time, that's not how they're actually gonna to respond to a cover um, in the real world, in the wild. But also, if you ask for feedback, you'll get feedback and people will give you feedback on your cover, but they don't really know anything about book cover design or marketing. So they may tell you a lot of things that's true for them, but may not be true for readers of your genre or um, kind of design standards in general. But also you're only asking them to give feedback on your book cover design. So usually they'll say stuff like, why don't you change this font or move this around over here? And often, if you have a cover that isn't that great and you just tweak it and fix it a little bit, it'll be a little bit better, but it still won't be great. Uh, usually, when your cover isn't good enough, you need a makeover. You need a totally new picture and fonts um, and layout. And it's going to take kind of a, a professional to do that. Does it sell? You can, the, the real, the telling point, whether your book cover is good enough, is if it sells. So if you're... If your book is up on Amazon and it's not selling, then you need a new cover. You'll probably need a new cover. You can also figure out how much resistance there is. So when you're starting off publishing, I can't tell if that should be resistance or resistance, but um, when you're emailing people and you're saying, hey, would you review my book cover? Or you're, you're taking it into bookstores or you're handing it to your friends. Um, if you're asking, like if you ask your friends or family for feedback, they'll be yeah, sure, it's great. I love your cover. It looks awesome. They'll be really supportive because your friends and family will be supportive of your publishing endeavor. But when you take it to real people uh, or strangers, like even if you go up to a, a bookstore and you're talking with someone face to face, they may be polite and be nice and just tell you something like, we don't take self-published books. They won't tell you your book looks really ugly because it's unprofessional. Um, nobody's actually going to tell you that to your face. So the real test is if it's up on Amazon and it's not selling, or you do a promotion and it's not selling. You can test out advertising. So if you're, if you're running ads, if you're showing your book cover in the ad and nobody's clicking, that's probably a problem with the book cover. And if you take that book cover off and just show the picture ad or show the ad with some other nice stock photography and people do click on it, then it's a problem with your cover, especially if... They click on your ads that don't have the cover, but they don't buy the book on Amazon. That's a big warning sign that your cover isn't good enough. You can also try getting professional feedback. So professional feedback means from a cover designer um, or somebody who's really, really in the publishing industry. But even so, there's a lot of people who are self-publishing gurus who have really big platforms who know a lot about publishing who may not be able to give you good feedback on your on your book cover design. So you really need to look for a designer um, and a book cover designer. I actually, um, I set up a site that was www does my cover suck or does my book cover suck, where you could upload your cover and people would rate whether they liked it, which is still a pretty good idea. It was kind of a way to get real feedback from strangers without having the problem, like when you ask someone on Facebook, everyone's kind of be, going to be nice to you. Um, or some people will say, no, it sucks, but then you don't know what to do with it. So I set up a site that you can get a lot of votes, basically. And um, after you get a couple hundred votes, you would know whether most people think your cover is, is good enough or not. But I'm not managing the site anymore, so I'm not really recommending that you find it and upload it. I also have a Facebook um, group for something similar, but I don't really use it. Often people will just email me for feedback on their covers, and you're welcome to do that. The 
final point here is, is it, is it exactly what you wanted? Do you love it? If you got a cover made that's exactly what you wanted, that may be a warning sign that's not a very good cover. And the same thing, if you made it yourself or you told the designer exactly what to make and you totally love it because it's exactly what you wanted and you think it's amazing, that could be a warning sign. It's also frustrating because the more you love it, the more you believe in your cover, the more reluctant you're going to be to notice that it's not selling or other people don't like it or people are critical of it. Um, and a lot of times people won't tell you to your face, but like when people pick up the cover, they might have this reluctance or this resistance or, or like, yeah, it's really good, but there's just something a little off. Um, you need to be open to the idea that your cover isn't good enough and that it's hurting your sales. Because if, if you're not thinking it might be the cover, then you're going to waste so much time on advertising and promotion and marketing and everything you do is going to be so much more work because your cover isn't as professional as it could have been. So one of the easiest ways, like if you're not selling, your marketing isn't working, your advertising isn't working, like just nothing's working, you've been doing it for a long time, that's usually an indication that the cover is not good enough. And you can test out a new one simply and cheaply by using Canva or WordSwag. Canva is a an app online. Um, the nice thing about Canva is that it keeps it simple. So you can just choose a template and use some of their nice fonts and put it together. You can buy a simple stock photography and you just buy one nice picture that kind of kind of represents your book. It's always better to get something that's marginally related and gets the genre right and looks good and attracts the readers. That's better than something that's specific to your book. And I didn't mention that earlier, but um, I mean, certain things, like if you have a character on the, the cover, of course, the eye color and the hair color should match. But when you get into stuff like these are the shoes that she would be wearing and, you know, the, the, the room in the background, the chair is blue and not pink, little, little details like that really don't matter that much. It's better to have a strong, simple cover that sells the book than one that's factual, factually accurate because nobody's going to know whether it's factually accurate until they're done reading the book. And after they're done with it, they're not going to care what's on the cover, even if they notice they're not going to care. They'll just be like, oh, that's interesting. It's a different color chair on the cover. Um, almost nobody's going to notice. But the job of the cover is just to get them to read the book. So even if you just make something simple that's one picture and some clean, simple text, that might be better than whatever you've got right now. So it's an easy thing that you can make and test out and just see if it helps. So this is the end of my presentation. You can email me, you can find me online. Um, I have lots of websites for authors about book design and also book marketing. Um, and thanks, I wish you good luck in your publishing adventures.